If you're interested in linguistics, you've probably heard about the pattern in which basic colour categories develop in languages, and if not, I'm going to link a video about that. I'd recommend watching that before this video. But that theory isn't perfect, and focusing just on basic colour terms means missing some interesting things about how colour evolves in language and why. In the original version of Berlin and Kay's theory, each language takes the whole spectrum of colour, and over time it splits that spectrum into smaller and smaller basic colour categories. Basic colour categories are things like green or red. Terms that don't have an obvious other meaning, refer to the same colour no matter the context, and can't be considered part of another colour. First the spectrum splits into two colours, dark and light. Then it splits into three, dark, light and red. And so on, subdividing the spectrum into smaller and smaller sections. But this doesn't work for every language, for a couple of reasons. In some languages, the whole spectrum just isn't covered by basic colour terms. The yellow language, spoken in Papua New Guinea, only has three basic colour terms, corresponding to black, white and red. But they still understand and can express other colours, they just don't have standardised abstract forms for them. They don't think of all dark colours as fitting into their black colour term. Also, the original theory supposes that every language sees colour as a spectrum of saturation, hue and value. In English, that's true. There are only two colour terms I can think of in English that take anything else into account – silver and gold, which can imply shininess. But in some languages, there are colour terms that show glossiness or brightness, or where different terms are used depending on if an object is alive or not. In the Aboriginal Australian language Barara, there's a colour term that can refer to bright and shiny things no matter their hue. In Hanuna'o, spoken in the Philippines, the term for green also means juicy and shiny, and red means dry and hard, so that a yellow fruit might be considered green if it's ripe and red if it's dried up, even if its hue stays the same. Not every language sees colour as a spectrum at all, or as something that can be expressed abstractly. The original experiments asked people to identify the colours of different cards, but in some languages they couldn't ask that, because there wasn't a word for colour. In some cases, people experienced colour shock. They were horrified to see colour expressed as a spectrum. This is where the emergence hypothesis comes in, meant to explain some things that didn't quite match real languages. In this version, there isn't always a universal spectrum that gets gradually split up. Colours start being talked about when they become useful. In a world with not much colour technology, no dyes or pigments, there's not really much use for colour words, unless you're talking about things that come in different colours like hair or horses. In English, the colour words for hair and horses are still slightly split from the regular colour words. The term blonde is only really used for hair, and when referring to horses, grey really means white. Older colour terms survive in these more specialised terminologies, such as dun and sorrel, which were once mainstream English colour terms but now only really refer to horses. In the northern Sofo language of South Africa, there's a whole separate lexicon for cattle colours. In this world, you don't really need to specify many colours, and when you do, it's probably because it means more than just colour. This might result in a system like Hanunoo. If you're specifying that a tree has red leaves rather than green, you're implying that it's dead and dry rather than alive, and so red can become synonymous with deadness and dryness, and green with vitality. Many languages colour systems cared about things that weren't hue. In Old English, we had lots of terms talking about paleness and saturation. Dun and Sorrel both come from Old English terms that had no reference to hue. But during the medieval period, we gained increasing access to dyes and pigments. Things could come in different hues, and so we needed more ability to specify hues. Words like crimson, vermilion and russet, originally referring to different dyes, came to stand for colours. Trade gave us access to even more colours, and their names reflected trade networks, with names like turquoise after Turkey coming through French, indigo after India coming through Latin, or orange, which reached English through Arabic and Spanish. Orange is one I find particularly interesting. It was first used in English as a colour name in the 1500s, replacing the Anglo-Saxon yellow-red. But people didn't seem to think of it as a basic colour yet. In medieval Europe, the colours of the rainbow were considered to be red, yellow, green, blue and violet. Then Isaac Newton came along. Newton's colour theory did involve more scientific observation than earlier philosophers. 
but he intentionally divided the rainbow into seven colours, because he wanted it to match the seven notes of the musical octave, adding orange and indigo. Indigo and violet seem to have kind of been absorbed by purple, probably because we now think of the colour wheel as symmetrical, and six colours fit better than seven. But I think it's partially down to Newton that English sees orange as a colour in its own right, distinct from yellow and red. The original theory kind of makes it seem like basic colour terms just appear as people, I don't know, get more observant. But while there are definitely universal trends, I reckon it's just as interesting to look at the very different ways that people conceptualise colour and how history and culture can shape these. <laughs>